They are Santa's naughtiest little elves. The Smiley Morning Show. Broadcasting live to the North Pole and all over the world. This is 99.5 WZPLFM. You're listening to Smiley's annual Christmas pageant at Moondog Town. Hello and welcome to the Smiley Morning Show adaptation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. We are live right now at the Moondog Tavern. Put your hands together and make some noise for tonight's Smiley Morning Show. Play us. First from the Smiley Morning Show, co-host KJ. Indiana's weatherman, Paul Poteet. Producer Will. Tony Williams. And from WZPL's afternoon show, Nikki Reed. Where are you at, Nikki? She's the little slutty Dutch girl over there in the corner. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Okay, got it. <laughs> uh, from Channel 13, our very special guest tonight, uh, the silver-haired fox, Scott Swan, is here. Yep. I am Dave Smiley. Are you guys ready? Okay. And now we take you back in a time to Christmas long, long ago. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatsoever about that. Marley was as dead as a doornail. I don't know what there is particularly dead about a doornail, but permit me to repeat once again emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Marley was as dead as the CBSI and the Wish TV logo right about now. That... Too soon, sorry about that. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and he had been partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was Marley's sole friend and the only man who mourned him, if Scrooge can be said to have mourned him, to have been mourned at all. There is no doubt that Marley was dead. Are you following me on this? Marley was dead. As dead as any chance that Pat McAfee will ever be on the Smiley Morning Show's friend list anytime soon. That dead, that's how dead I'm talking about. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story that I'm about to relate. So now that you know that Marley was absolutely dead, our story may now begin. It was Christmas Eve of 1843. It was bitterly cold, the wind chill factors well below freezing. The fog was as thick as Megan Trainer's base. <laughs> Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. His clerk, Bob Cratchit, sat nearby trying to warn himself at a candle. It was in that moment that Scrooge's nephew, Fred, burst in through the door, full of Christmas cheer, disrupt disrupting the gloomy and chilly quiet of the counting house. A Merry Christmas, Uncle! What? I said a Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! Bah humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle? Surely you don't mean that. Of course I mean it. Merry Christmas indeed. What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come, Uncle. What reason have you to be dismal? You're rich enough. You have tons of money, like Dave Smiley. <laughs> <laughs> bah, that bald DJ. <laughs> Away with Merry Christmas. What's Christmas to you? But a time for paying bills without money. A time for finding yourself a year older, not an hour richer. A time for jingling smiley sack and finding nothing ever good comes of it. <laughs> if I could work my will, every idiot who goes around with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Uncle! Nephew! <laughs> keep Christmas in your own way. Let it keep it in mind. Keep it? But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. A lot of good it's done you. Well, there are many things from which I have benefited, even if I didn't show a profit. I dare say, Christmas among the rest. I am sure I have always thought of Christmas as a good cause. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time of year I know when men and women seem to be by consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and put lights up around a war monument and call it a tree. <laughs> and therefore, Uncle, 
Though it has never put a scrap of silver or gold in my pocket, nor allowed me to see Chuck Lofton shirtless, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Hear, hear. Another sound out of you, Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your position. Sorry. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come and dine with us tomorrow. I'll see myself in hell first. I'd rather visit Bill Cosby's house and have a drink. But... But why, Uncle? Why? Why? Let me ask you a question. Why... Did you get married recently? Because the Supreme Court overruled Indiana's ban on gay marriage. You're gay? Well, who knows? W would it even matter to you if I were, Uncle? The fact is, I fell in love. Love? You fell in love? Ha! Good but, afternoon, nephew. But you never come to see me before I got married. Why give it a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon! I want nothing from you. I ask nothing from you. Why can't we... Be friends. Good afternoon. I am sorry to find you so resolute. You've never had a quarrel, you and I. I came all the way to give you greetings of the season, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So, a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. <laughs> and, a, and a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, Bob Cratchit. Thank you, Fred. A Merry Christmas to you! <laughs> Great. Now two idiots with Merry Christmas on their lips. The two of you would make a lovely couple. Cratch it. I said leave, gay nephew! I'm sorry, sir. I'm Mr. Howell, and this is my partner, Mr. Jeeves. Partner?! Yes, I get it now. Gay marriage is legal. Oh, no, no, no. Mr. Jeeves isn't my, um, doing it partner. He's my business partner in charity collections. Oh, God. Charity beggars. Even worse. Scrooge and Marley's. I believe? Have I had the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's dead. Oh. In fact, he died seven years ago this very night. Oh, well, I am quite sorry to hear it, but I have... No doubt his generosity is well represented by his surviving partner. Guaranteed not. It isn't. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and needy who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of basic needs. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Do they disappear? Oh, no, sir. There are still plenty of prisons. And the workhouses for the poor, still in operation, I assume. They are. Still, I wish I could say they were not. Is the Smiley Morning Show still doing? Show us your cans to replenish Gleaner's food banks, then? <laughs> yes, at the Hooters, or some other boob-themed restaurant. Every year, sir. <laughs> oh, well, I was afraid from... What you had said that something had stopped them in their useful course. I'm glad to hear it. Given a scarcely furnished good cheer to the multitude, a few of us are trying to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and some means of warmth. Maybe some vanilla mint or cinnamon toothpaste. We choose this time because it is a time above others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices and their breath is especially stank from a year's lack of brushing. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. Ah, you wish to be anonymous then. I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas. And I can't afford to make idle people merry. I am taxed for the institutions I have mentioned, and they cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there or play a saxophone poorly <laughs> underneath the arts garden downtown. <laughs> or look sick and hold cardboard signs at mayor intersections, I'm sorry, major intersections, <laughs> along Meridian, Keystone and such. But many can't go there, and many would rather die. Oh well, if they'd rather die, perhaps they should go ahead and do it and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I wouldn't know anything about it. Well, how could you know it, sir? It's none of my business. 
I have too much of my own business to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly, and I'll thank you for, and I'll, what? <laughs> Mine occupies me constantly, and I'll thank you to leave it to me. Leave. I need, what? Leave it to me. Leave me to Leave it. it. Leave me to it. I think it's what that. you mean, sir. Leave me to it. I need to post a picture of my food on Facebook now. Good afternoon. <laughs> Well, I'll leave you to it. Good day, sir. Good day. Come, they told him. pum A newborn king to see. Pa-ra-pa-pum-pum. Uh. Scrooge. Shots. Scrooge. Get away from here. I'll pa rum pa pump you with a my cane. <laughs> I didn't ask to be bothered with that noise. No! Ah! Run away! Run away! Run away! Crunch it! Oh, okay. I suppose you'll want a uh, Christmas day off tomorrow, huh? If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. You take more days off than Tony Williams. <laughs> if I was to hold back a half a crown for it, you'd think you'd be abused. No doubt. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> And yet, you don't think me ill use when, when I pay a day's wages for no work. But this request, sir, it's only as frequent as Dave Smiley has relations just once per year. Poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose, if you must have it, be here all the early next morning. Oh, yes, sir. I shall. I certainly shall. And with that, the workday came to an end. For Bob Cratchit, he bundled himself in his scarf and hat, snuffed out his candle, and left the counting house with a skip and a step to meet his youngest son, Tim. Bob liked to call him Tiny Tim, and despite Tim's sickness, which left him to hobble on a crutch, his face often glowed, as you can see there very clearly with a smile. Is that a champagne cheek kind of a glow, or just a regular glow? Especially every evening when Tiny Tim and Bob Cratchit would meet up and have their walk home together. Father! <coughs> Hello, my dear son! <laughs> Father, I have been waiting for you. <coughs> Let's go to the Children's Museum and watch the children smear the Dinosphere exhibit glass with their snot. Someday, you'll get to play with all the other kids too, but probably from inside a bubble or something. <laughs> I feel that I am getting stronger every day. <coughs> uh, stronger? <coughs> yes. That's what I bet is happening. And do you remember what tomorrow is? Christmas Day! <coughs> uh, and, day! And I am to have the whole day off to celebrate with my family. Hooray for cr <coughs> Christmas! Free sick day! Yes, you, you get lots of those, don't you, Tim? <laughs> yep. <coughs> <coughs> hey, let's sing our favorite carol. Jingle, jingle bells, bells, jingle bells, jingle, bells, jingle, jingle all the way. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the narrator is so glad he's not using Tiny Tim's microphone as the <laughs> story continues. As they sing carols all the way home, their world of troubles melted away. But Scrooge, Scrooge was a lonely old D-bag. <laughs> His night would not be filled with Carol's or Mary's or probably Sarah's either. Scrooge took his miserable melancholy walk back to his miserable melancholy home. He lived in chambers, which had once belonged to his deceased partner, Jacob Marley. They were a gloomy suite of rooms, old and dreary, for nobody lived in it but Scrooge. Upon arriving back to this home, Scrooge took off his cravat you have your cravat off? <laughs> Put on a really hideously ugly freaking sweater. <laughs> then his dressing gown, slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the fire to eat his gruel. It was a very low fire. Indeed, nothing on such a bitter night. He was obliged to sit close to it and brood over it before he could extract the least sensation of warmth from such a handful of coal. 
Hmm, yes, my gruel. He sat in front of an empty fireplace in his dressing gown, slippers, and nightcap, eating his gruel, disgusting, mumbling occasionally. Hmm, yes, I like money, and gruel, and money. I hate people. Mm. Terrible, this is the worst. But suddenly, Scrooge's calling bell began to ring. Huh? What the? Who's there? Huh. Nothing. The bell stopped suddenly, leaving Scrooge momentarily frozen. Gruel. I like gruel. <laughs> I hate you people. <laughs> <laughs> then the sound... Not the first time in the house, probably, of dragging chains. <laughs> Distinctly, chains being dragged across the floor. The chains broke his mumbling. Uh, what? What? What the devil? Screw! Humbug! Hallucinations. I shouldn't have eaten out all that. <laughs> I shouldn't have. Could you eaten clarify that? I shouldn't have eaten out of Jim Ursay's duffel bag on the walk home. <laughs> I won't believe it. <laughs> the scene is caramel. <laughs> A grayish-white figure bound in grayish-white cash boxes and thick ledgers and oversized chains secured with huge padlocks emerged from a thick fog before Scrooge. How's this? A ghost? What do you want from me? Much! Who are you? Ask me who I was. <laughs> You're dead, right? Yes! Ask me who I was. <laughs> All right. Were you Philip Seymour Hoffman? No! Okay, were you Blue too? The b butler mascot. I, I didn't mean guess who I was. Hold on. Don't tell me. I literally meant just ask who I was. I got it. You're Joan Rivers. No! Shirley Temple. Shut up! All right, who are you? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Ha! I don't believe it. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You might be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a hot dog I ate in a meal instead of a snack, or three-ish bottles of Dave Matthews wine. <laughs> There's more of gravy than of grave about you. Whatever you are. <laughs> Mercy! <laughs> Dreadful apparition! Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must. But why have you come to me? It is required of every man that his spirit should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide, and if that spirit does not do right by his life, it is condemned to witness that which he might have shared and turn to happiness. Oh, oh, woe is me! You sound strained and paranoid and crazy, spirit, like Scott Stapp or Amanda Bynes <laughs> making a Facebook video. Tell me why! I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link, yard by yard, and wart of my own free will. Is the pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you'll bear yourself? It was a long and heavy as this seven years ago. You have labored on your sense. It is a ponderous chain. It was ponderous, man. Ponderous. <laughs> Jacob, old friend, please comfort me. I have none to give. 
I have little time. I cannot rest. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. Oh, not to have known others working kindly in its little sphere. Any person will find their mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. To not know that no amount of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. A huge waste of breath and life. A Kim Kardashian. At least your giant naked ass wasn't ever used as a champagne shelf on the cover of an obscure magazine. So, she might be a little worse than me, but still, I was a pretty terrible person who offered little compassion or feeling toward my fellow man. But you always were a good man of business, Jacob. Business? Humankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Who oh, did I walk through the crowds? Why did I walk through the crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down? Hear me now, Scrooge! My time is merely done here, like CBS programming on Wish TV 8. <laughs> I will, Jacob. But don't be hard on me. I am here to warn you. That you have yet a chance of escaping my fate. A chance I have procured for you, Ebenezer. You are always a good friend. Thank you. You will be visited by three spirits. Is is that the chance you mention? It is. Oh, well, then I, I think I'd rather not be visited by three ghosts. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I've tread. Expect the first spirit to cross this very night when the bo- bell tolls one, not the ball. I'm sorry, what were they? The When the bell tolls one. <laughs> <laughs> Can't they my all? Be- my ball's toll too. I just... Can't they all come at once and have it over with, Jacob? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more and for your sake. Take care that you remember what has passed between us. Who? Oh! 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 is me! Oh! is me! Oh! 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 To loser hell I go! Oh, humbug. I believe I have just soiled my pajama bottoms. Or you may have soiled your pajama bottoms. <laughs> what did I say? I think you, s- I think you said sailed. <laughs> or maybe you sold them on Craigslist. Look, it's Smiley's dirty pajama bottoms. We'll meet in a parking lot and buy them. But now back to our story. Upon changing his pants, which is why I had to establish the whole soiled thing, sorry about that. Upon changing his pants, Scrooge slinked back to bed and closed the bed curtains around him, hoping that perhaps within these thin walls of cloth, it might keep out the three spirits that Marley had mentioned. Will these three spirits visit Scrooge on this night, or has this all been a hallucination brought on by bad gruel? Stay right here, because soon we will all find out together when we return to the Smiley Morning Show's A Christmas Carol on 99.5 WZPL, live from the Moondog Tavern. <laughs>